classic, classic warm up. Hello, this is the Never Heard of It podcast. I'm Sean Harwell. And I'm Craig Moorhead, and this is the podcast where we talk about the movies that have fallen through your cracks. I want to go ahead and set this one up by saying, uh, I think of all the ones we've done, by far the one I'm most ashamed of not having any clue uh, that this movie existed whatsoever. It does have a lot of traits that should easily put it on a map for yeah. anyone who loves movies. If you have another suggestion like this, and I'm sure there are plenty of them, hit us up on Twitter. We are at Never Podcast. You can find us online at all the various places you might want to find us. We got an IMDb list. I don't know if anybody ever looks at that. You ever want to just see what all the movies we talk about? You can look up our podcast on IMDb. There you'll have all the information you need. Mm. Craig, how are you? I'm doing great, Sean. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited to talk about this one, though. I feel like these movies are the ones that kind of get get me pumped up about doing this podcast and why I'm glad we're doing this thing. For no other reason than selfishly seeing something I should have seen, but then, uh, yeah, it's a cool one to talk about, I think. I agree. You know, it's kind of like we found a, a missing puzzle piece here. Let's put it together. Today's film was indeed suggested by a listener to our podcast. The Twitter handle of this person is at 9 Hour Films. And Craig, guess what? Mm. 9 Hour Films makes a podcast themselves. Really? So we're not the only one. Uh, and in fact, I want to recommend all of you go check this podcast out right now. And then you just come back and listen to ours, whatever. The podcast is called Introductions Necessary. And this is a podcast that I believe daily, daily, Craig, daily introduces you and your friends to a notable woman in the field of science, technology, engineering, or math. I love it already. They hit it in like four or five minutes and get out. It's really informative. You and I both have young daughters. When, when our daughters ask which podcast they should listen to, I think I'm going to point them in this direction. I fully agree. So very, very cool. Check that out, introductionsnecessary.com, or look it up in your favorite podcast app. And yes, finally, the movie that they suggested was the 1947 Charlie Chaplin starring... Directed, based on an idea by Orson Welles' movie, Monsieur Vadou. Mm. Our synopsis is actually coming from the LA Times today. Monsieur Vadou is loosely modeled on the French blue beard and tabloid sensation Henri Landru. Vadou is an unlikely Don Juan, a dapper polygamist and serial killer with a young son and handicapped wife whom he supports by marrying and dispatching a series of wealthy, gullible matrons. An icy, elegant black comedy, the film builds to a lengthy philosophical indictment of the sins of modern capitalism. Captured and bound for the guillotine, Verdu is persuaded by a reporter to deliver a death row valediction, a story with a moral. In the ensuing monologue, he declares his own crimes trivial within the context of a murderous society. Quote, As a mass killer, I'm an amateur by comparison. End quote. So once again, this is a movie starring Charlie Chaplin, <laughs> America's little tramp and silent <laughs> screen star, as a polygamist and serial killer. Craig, thoughts? It was the role he was born to play. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he agrees. <laughs> Going in, I, I, I knew basically what, what it was about. I understood that, well, and I guess at the beginning, there's sort of a a card that you read that suggests the fact that there's, you know, he's, he's a, a bad guy anyway. So going in, I, you know, I knew that he was essentially playing a bad character, which was interesting to me. And mm -hmm. uh, it certainly delivered on that promise. Yes, it did. I, I think it's interesting, the fact that he directed it. I, I, I feel like there were, there were those moments where you kind of felt, you kind of saw some of those old Charlie Chaplin moments. Some are really obvious. Some are just the fact that something's been staged in a room and, and it's it, there's sort of just this intricacy to the way that it's staged that just seemed like, yeah, it's something that Charlie Chaplin would do. Whereas later on, it gets full on slapstick yes. in a few moments. And I'll say also, and I realize I've brought this up for a lot of movies in our podcast specifically, and, I, and I'm wondering, is this pointing to a, a fault of my own, some sort of something that's lacking in my own uh, thought process? But it's like getting married and divorced. Like after the fourth wife, it's your fault. Right? Like, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Maybe they're not all horrible. <laughs> um, it might be you. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I, I enjoyed the movie, but but overall, the tone was was really all over the place. There there were a lot of places that uh that it kind of shook loose for me, and and not it's certainly not. Uh, the, the, the worst offender uh, in terms of how much it lost me compared to some others that we've talked about. It, it felt kind of like it was trying to ha have things both ways. 
telling this mm-hmm. dark story, but also letting Charlie Chaplin do his thing. And they didn't really always work together, I don't think. But I don't know. Talk me out of that. Well, I don't know that I am going to talk you out of it, but I do want to say, if you felt that way in 2016, imagine what people felt in 1947, mm-hmm. you know? And it's not like the movie doesn't try to warn you. In fact, I think the subtitle of the movie on the title card is A Comedy of Murders. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at a poster right now from the film. Literally above Charles, Charles Chaplin's name, above the title and everything, is the, the big block letters that says, Chaplin Changes, Can You? Oh, yeah. Question mark. That's on the poster. So th- they, I think they were aware of what they were getting into a little mm-hmm. bit. Uh, that said, I think the reception initially, you know, according to Wikipedia here, was, was, was not good. Not in America, it sounded like, yeah. It wasn't until much later, I think in the, in the 60s, coincidentally around the time that Dr. Strangelove was, was out, that it started to get a deeper appreciation and, and looked at again. And now, yeah, I mean, this was released by Criterion in 2013. It, it's certainly a notable film, not only because of the people involved, but I think because of what it ultimately ends up being at the end of that movie, which is, was hinted at the, in the synopsis there, was was a, a pretty strong indictment of society at yeah. the time. I mean, across the board. One of the quotes that I wrote down from that end, and this is, again, Chaplin's played a murder and, and his crimes have caught up with him. He's being sentenced to death. He, um, I think this is in the courthouse. He says, as for being a mass murderer, has not the world we live in encouraged it? And... I would say no <laughs> in any situation. It has not. But he raised the question. And I think doing that in a major movie at that time as a major star, man, that took some balls. I agree. Let me ask you this. Now, you've said several times in, in both just our friendship and this podcast that you are a good bit smarter than me. Did you feel like you saw this coming. Did you understand as you're watching it, like, wow, this is a pretty strong uh, critique of the capitalist ideology? I think in hindsight, I probably should have. Only, mm-hmm. And I'll say this only because I've watched The Great Dictator in the past two or three years. Yeah. And that movie, you know, there's some hysterical sequences in that movie. I mean, that image of Chaplin as Hitler basically kicking this large inflated globe around is a thing of beauty. But man, that that movie ends with one hell of a monologue about what's going on in the world. So I think, you know, I probably should have. Here's what I thought. Honest to God, I thought at some point he was going to reveal himself to have not killed these women, that there was some, you know, there was some other explanation for it that, you know, he was not the bad person that they, in, from the pretty much very opening scene, you're with a family and they're saying, we haven't heard from Thelma in three months. She went on honeymoon with this guy. What's happened to her? Her money has been withdrawn from the bank. This is not like her. This is not like her. Maybe he murdered her. But even that, to get into your tone, even that scene, I don't know if you remember it ends with them finally showing a picture of this man that they've been talking about. And there's Chaplin with this weird little broad <laughs> yeah. grin on his face, uh-huh. you know? I mean, and so even then I was like, okay, well, you know, I read the title card and it says a comedy of murders. I still didn't necessarily imagine that he was going to be the one doing the murdering. Well, and that's, that's an interesting point. I mean, uh, and I, I didn't feel exactly the same way. I didn't think it was going to be revealed that he didn't do anything. But I, I was resisting the idea that he was a bad person because it's Charlie Chaplin. Yeah. Somehow. And, and let's let's stop that, though, because I don't you know, I think, OK, I think he obviously is keenly aware of what his public reception is. And I think that's the cleverness of the movie in a lot of ways, because, yeah, the first real time you see him, he's cutting roses from the garden and there's the neighbors across the way and he's very polite and dapper and friendly and there's a woman that is coming to look at this house that you know he's unfortunately having to sell because his wife has died recently and he can't bear the thought of living there and afford it i guess and within what like a a two minutes of conversation with this new prospective buyer this widowed woman in her 40s or 50s he's throwing himself at her and that's, I mean, it's, it's played comedically. Like, yes. you know, it, there's no other explanation for it other than, oh, look at this crazy loon throwing himself at this woman yeah. and, you know, falling all over himself. God, did he, did, he, did he fall out of the window in that scene too? He certainly did. <laughs> right, okay. So yeah, you've got these things. And I mean, how much do you think that is Chaplin knowing exactly what he's doing 
and setting up the ending then and, and messing with our preconceived notions of who he is as a character and how much of that is just think, well, that's his filmmaking DNA. Like that's kind of who he is. Of course he's going to have those scenes yeah. because that's his bread and butter. Well, I, I will say I don't remember any of those moments like when he falls out of the window and uh, th- there's one very late at the end where he, he does this incredible move to, to trap some folks inside of a room. Yeah. At least I don't remember there being a, a moment where he did any of that slapstick to lighten a really dark moment. I got one for you. Oh, okay. And I loved it. Okay. Or maybe I just forgot. He is on the boat, on a boat, small rowboat. Oh, yes. With, Agreed. Okay. You know which one I'm talking about? Right. Yeah. With uh, Annabella, Madame Bonneau. Yeah. Played by Martha Ray, who I, I didn't know before this. She's amazing in this movie. Like, she... I'll just read you like on her IMDb little bio here. It says, first thing it says, known as quote, the big mouth. Yes. End quote. And considered the female equivalent to Bob Hope. So I think she started in a bunch of movies with like George Burns, Bob Hope. Well, but she did those commercials. What commercials? I don't know her. I know her from, I think, denture commercials, maybe. God, I hope you're I remember right. in the 80s, it was like, <laughs> hi, I'm Martha Ray. I'm the big mouth. Really? Yeah. Okay. That's fantastic. That makes so much sense. Yeah. The big mouth. We got it. Who do we get for dentures? Let's get the big mouth. Yes, extra strength polydent. <laughs> That's amazing. We'll have to find one of those and put it up on our uh, Facebook page or YouTube. Yeah, she must have made a ton of money off those commercials. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, in this movie, yeah, she is a big man. Like she's just this like overbearingly kind of obnoxious woman who. Um, but she, yeah, she's a loud mouth, grating, a little immature, and she just has a ton of money and. Right. So she's maybe the one in the movie where you're like, oh yeah, just. Go ahead and kill her. You know, you're, you're waiting for him to do it. There was a previous moment where he was going to do it at her house, but the maid ended up being there when they thought the maid was going to leave. This kind of hilarious bit of misdirection with uh, a bottle of wine and a bottle of poison. And then later, finally, he gets her away from the house. They're out on a lake on a rowboat. This ridiculous thing where she's like trying to catch a fish, has absolutely no clue how to use a fishing rod, but she's insisting that she do it and that everything he's doing is wrong. And you see him behind her, like get out a cloth and he's getting ready to chloroform her. And then she bumps into him and he falls backwards and the handkerchief falls over his own face. <laughs> yeah. And that was like, that's a killer gag. I think, you know, that to me feels so modern. Like I could absolutely see that in a weird, like darkly comedic TV show right now, even. Yeah. That was, yeah, that was the one instance where I could think the old chaplain, just sort of that, that physical style of what he does so well. Mm hmm was used specifically the, with the murderous side of this character, I guess. Yes, that's true. I, I, I had totally forgotten about that, and that is an entire sequence. Everything with her is just him attempting these murders and, and it just never working out. Well, let's separate the two for a second then. <laughs> and was there a highlight sort of comedic piece in this for you? I mean, I, I, honestly, I, I was so much more interested in just how the plot was playing out. I was more interested in the moments where, for instance, when... He needed to cover his, or, or he, he wanted to buy stock, or he wanted to cover his... Uh, That's basically right. What, what he owed, yeah. Just how he went and talked to the, the, the first woman into parting with her money. Like mm-hmm. that whole sequence. And she doesn't believe him, and she just keeps talking about how she should have her head examined for believing that there's going to be a run on the banks and all this kind of stuff. And I found myself more interested in that. And there was nothing particularly funny about any of that, as I remember. Nothing... Hilarious. No, I mean there's there is a slap fight. There's a there's definitely a literal slap fight in this movie. Oh yeah, um, with with a guy that um he, I can't remember the, the exact discussion, but there was discussion about one of his wives giving money to a guy who was trying to uh, sell her on a device that turns salt water into gasoline or something yeah. <laughs> like that, which was ridiculous. And then there was a pretty solid spit take towards the end of the film where Chaplin sees the Martha Ray character. When he's supposed to be getting married to Madame Gourney or Groney, or what, I can't remember. Yes. Her name. Forgive me. And it's not just that he spits the champagne out or, or wine or whatever it was, it's that he hits the, the back of the neck of the guy standing right beside him. So that's always going to make me laugh, you know? Indeed. No, and I, and I agree with that. I agree very much with that. You know, for me, it was definitely the chloroform thing. That was the best and only like really, truly surprising gag of this, this film. But then I think, yeah, what's going to stick with me about this is partly the structure. You know, there's some really just smart 
clever turns in this movie, I thought. Mm -hmm. You have this opening with all these people. I mean, it's like, what, about five, six characters from one of the families, their beloved Thelma, left them to go marry this guy. And, like, they're just like an awful family. Like, they're (laughs) at each other's throats. All seem to be completely miserable human beings. And, you know, it's just one of those great things where they're talking about somebody that's not in the room. Two people in this instance. But, obviously, the focus being on the Chaplin character. And so that's just, that's a really cool way to build up intrigue about somebody that you haven't seen yet, you know? Yeah. I like that. And then I think part of me got lost a bit of the, in the shuffle of, I mean, there are so many insert shots of train wheels on a train yeah. track ch- chugging from light, left to right and then chugging from right to left as he goes back and forth across the country to his various wives. But I I liked some of the basic thriller moments, like when the detective tracks him down and we know he's got the poison wine. We almost don't even see, I I don't remember him like setting it down on the table. Anyway, these two characters, a detective and a murderer, sit down. The detective basically reveals that he knows exactly what Chaplin's character has been up to and then pours himself a glass of wine, which we know is poisoned. And yeah, the next day he's dead. Yeah. So he gets off the hook. And I, I just thought that was that was done well. Like that. Well, was, it was a great payoff because because yeah, it really was. He, he set it all up in that in that one conversation where it was just interesting. Uh, where he's talking about something where he he theorized there was a poison that you could use that the person would never feel anything. Which which that made a, a lot of sense to me. You know that he he doesn't want to actually hurt people, but this is how he's going to make money. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so there's this poison. You have this whole uh, sequence with this other woman where he's thinking about poisoning her and then doesn't. And then he tries to poison uh, Martha Ray, and that just goes all to hell. And so by that right. time, you know exactly what the bottle of wine means, you know, like all that stuff. So you don't have to explain anything. You don't have to go through a lot of hoops. Yeah, it, it was very clever. He asked the detective, would you permit me to see my wife one last time before you take me in? I'll, I'll sign a full confession. Right. And of course the detective agrees and they share some wine, which means he's poisoned the guy. So now all he has to do is travel on a train far enough, you know, give it an hour, hour and a half, and that Wait detective should be dead. dead and then he's out. So that was super clever and, and just, just a great payoff. By the way, the the man that he was having the discussion about the poison with, that <laughs> that guy reminded me of, you know, Dilbert's boss. Remember yeah. that? comic like, the, just the just pointed that, like, hair at the top yeah but just the tufts on either side and then bald in the middle and some very weird little round glasses that, that was an interesting character yeah one other thing that i thought structurally that was that was kind of cool it was surprising enough to me that i actually looked to see how far along i was in the movie you're 30 minutes in, and suddenly Chaplin is talking to a child that is revealed to be his own son. And he's gone back to visit, I I think, his original, his first wife, yes. Mona, who's in a wheelchair. And he's got like a, I don't know, the kid looked to be about like eight or nine years old or whatever. Mm-hmm. That was another tricky little move there, because you've just spent 30 minutes talking about this guy who's basically a known murderer and swindler. And now you're you're pushing the sympathy card by showing okay he's he's married to a you know a woman who's handicapped he's got a kid and clearly some financial trouble yeah. and like she even talks about the stress that he's been in since he left the bank did that throw you for a loop did you there was no mention of those characters prior to just showing up there was there there not that i knew of uh yeah not, not that i certainly not that i remember i don't think there was and at first when he went there i i assumed this was another family he had set up that he was gonna right. knock him down but the longer it went on i i just started to realize oh okay so this is part of his motivation he he, he was a successful uh businessman a a banker, I guess, for a while, and then lost that job. But, you know, he's actually got people in his life who he actually loves. And because of the capitalist system, like, here is what he's sort of forced to do, I guess. And I think that is also one of the reasons that I just felt like, okay, there's got to be some way where he gets away, gets away with this yeah. or gets some sort of reward or, or act of good graces towards at least these two people. Right. And now I'm thinking about it. I don't think there is any resolution to their story whatsoever, was there? Do we see them towards the end? Well, he mentioned later on when he ran into the girl again who became rich by marrying not for love. (laughs) 
right. I, I, I couldn't tell if, if he was saying that the wife and child had died or if if he had left them. What was it he said? Because he didn't say they passed. He, yeah, I, I, mean, I don't remember. I, he, he did say he lost his wife yeah, and I son. So, I thought so, yeah. And, it, and and I and that was the point where I was like, did I miss something before? At that point, it's it's the market crash. Everything went to hell. And yeah, was she was she so sick that you know there was no money to to do anything? Like he's he seems to be really that might have been really gone through a dark time. Yeah, that might have been what we were supposed to take away. I don't know if anybody else has seen this and remembers that. Now that we're talking about that it feels like a pretty important thing. <laughs> You yeah. know, and whether or not, if you remember what it is, that would be great. But also, if you remember whether or not we're supposed to believe it, or if it's one of those things that he's saying that we should take with a grain of salt, knowing who he is. Well, I'll say this. I think, like, looking at what the movie seems to be wanting to say, I feel like that that is what happened, and it is the truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you're probably because, right in that regard. Yeah, because it, it just seems like he won't be rewarded because because of the capitalist system. Right, the, this this woman is is has been rewarded. Let's talk about her, yeah, because she decided to marry someone who is rich, who she doesn't love. She she did away with love altogether, you know. I guess her humanity, maybe, and just said, "I'll just go for the money," and so she got it. Yeah, she was an interesting character. Uh, Chaplin first yeah. meets her basically just walking down the street one night, and she's sort of standing in a doorway, and she's, I think, credited as the girl. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, Marilyn Nash is the actress, but she, I mean, she's like 20 something, you know, he invites her back to his house as an act of kindness. I think he's like got an umbrella and is going to help her through the rain. And then, yeah, like that's, that's a pretty interesting turn to that character when he sees her years later and she's rich, like she's in a carriage and (laughs) has married, um, and he was a munitions dealer or something or manufacturer. Yeah. You know, basically, it's yeah. you know they're on the eve of war here and they're about to make a killing financially from it. So I don't know. Those are all. I mean, those are very deliberate choices. I didn't even really think about it at the time, but it does kind of paint a cynical picture in a lot of ways. Yeah, I wasn't even giving it credit for just how cynical it was at the time. But yeah, uh, and and you know now that she's found him, she seems legitimately happy again. Right to have seen him like like he's reminding her of you know what a better time for her soul anyway yeah. she's very insistent that they stay in touch and all that and as soon as she drives away he tears up her card and that kind of leads us to the end here actually it's not terribly long after that because he's with her at some you know dinner function where he's then spotted by members of that very first family that we saw in the opening and that ultimately leads to his arrest. Let's just talk about, you know, the last 10 minutes of this thing. I don't know, like, I want to say, like, how were you moved? Because I feel like, you know, A, were you moved? And like, B, did that ring a a bell of truth in some way? Or did it feel false to the movie? What I mean, there's a lot to kind of take in there at the end there. There's, there's, you know, certainly some some speechifying and some finger pointing. How does that sit with you just as far as satisfying conclusion to what's supposed to be a comedy of murders. Well, I guess the scene itself is interesting and it's, and it's fine. And, and I guess what bothered me was suddenly he was, I don't know. Suddenly it seemed like he had this, this big philosophy about all the stuff he'd been doing. Right. And you'd never really heard him talk in those terms throughout the entire movie. You didn't think this was a person who was like justifying what he was doing. At least I don't, think so i don't i don't think there were kind of tip-offs that he was like i don't think so well, i'm gonna murder people because blah 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 you know and he kind of lays it out at the end yeah if this were being made today like let's look at the movie seven david fincher's movie by comparison you yeah. know here you got a guy that's punishing the world for its sins and it becomes very apparent after they find that first body if i remember correctly you know but certainly mm-hmm. by the end you know exactly what path this guy is on and kind of what his his ethos is like what his philosophical take on the world is and why it's led him down here. But you're right. It does. It does kind of come out of a bit out of nowhere. I thought it was kind of interesting because, you know, there were moments where he does feel genuinely desperate. Like you get, you get glimpses of that, you know, the calls to the bank and just some of his actions and even just, just the act of trying not to get caught, you know, Mm -hmm. but then all that just goes away. Like once he's, in jail and once he's arrested it's kind of like his hands are behind his head and his feet are kicked up and he's like all right world you got me but guess what f you like this is all i'm just a reflection of you 
and, and yeah, and and suddenly he's he's sort of at peace. Uh, yeah, I guess. Well, me, yeah, you know what I mean. Like all, all that stuff where he's in this jail cell, he seems to be happy, yeah. and and he's kind of like offering people these words of wisdom and priests. No let less. Let me ask you this though: <laughs> Does it make sense to you that he made the decision to murder people to get money? Not in t- well, I was gonna say like, why would you marry people to? Get, you know, yeah. That it, there's definitely. I think some of that is a reflection of the times a little bit because that's mm-hmm. what would be expected, I guess. You know, it's it's some of that kind of entering high society a little bit. I, you know, I guess I wouldn't have minded 10% more of that, like seeing the guy who, you know, enjoying a little bit of the spoils of that lifestyle. Right. So you understand some of, yeah, why go through those hurdles? Because you don't get the oh, yeah. feeling that he's just killing these people, taking their money and then sending it back home. To the wife, right. you know, I mean, that doesn't really come across. Yeah. You know, yeah, I, I think some of that for me, I'm going to chalk it up a little bit to the times again. Like, you know, if this were being remade today, I think it would look a lot different, you know? Yeah. I don't know. What about you? Was that really hard to kind of get past or I mean, it, a little bit, yeah, I think a little it's, bit. And, it's, and I don't it's a valid know I, point. You know, maybe I missed something that would have explained it a little clearer. You know, here's the scene we never saw, which was he, he he's a banker. He loses his job. Then how else does he try to make money before he decides killing people is the way to go? Mm -hmm. I guess that's the connection I I don't really have. What it kind of feels like is he went from, okay, I'm a banker. I lost my job. I got to support my family who I love. And I've always kind of liked killing people. Like that kind of seems like that's why you're going to make that leap. If I just murder people, well, then I can do it. It's not like he's a lazy person. He's not a madman. And and it does seem like he's specifically targeting either people who seem unsavory or people who are who won't be missed. Right. But still, I I just I don't know. That's sort of the connective tissue that that stayed stuck in my head. And maybe if I knew more about the Bluebeard story, that would make more sense, and that would kind of be filled in for me. But yeah, they do throw around that term a little bit in the movie. I had no clue what it was. Yeah. I can just kind of tell you real quickly. It, it's a French folk tale, according to Wikipedia. It's the most Famous surviving version of which was written by Charles uh, Perrault, excuse me, and published in 1697. And the tale tells the story of a violent nobleman in the habit of murdering his wives in the attempts of one wife to avoid the fate of her predecessors. This has also been written in some form or another and retold by no less than Charles Dickens and Kurt Vonnegut. Hmm. And guess what, Craig? What's that? Wikipedia is saying that not only is uh, Monsieur Vardou... A sort of riff on that. So is the piano, hmm. which is something that we've talked about briefly when we talked about Holy wow. Smoke. I don't remember that at all. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, I don't either. And Ex Machina is one mentioned oh. as being kind of loosely akin to the Bluebird myth, which hmm. kind of makes sense. Well, don't spoil it for me. Okay. I think it's, it's a bit of a stretch. And Crimson Peak, which was, I think, Damian Leahy's favorite movie when he was yes. a guest on our show. Interesting. As we're talking about it, though, and all the things that you're saying, I'm sitting here thinking this would be an amazing TV series, right? Because yeah. you could have those moments where, you know, like Breaking Bad or something, where you truly understand why he's doing what he's doing. And, you know, just Absolutely. spinning the lies of, of having multiple wives and, and ultimately deciding why and how he's going to kill one and benefit from that and really see how the payoff is there and the, just the logistical nightmares of trying to, to keep all of that a secret. Yeah. Could be kind of cool. I I fully agree. How did you feel about setting this movie in France? Well, it, it, it suffered from one of those things, at least for, for me, where you, you said something fully in France and no one seems to be from France. Not whatsoever. Uh, they throw around an occasional French word. Merci. Yeah. It seems like a, a story that was written for French characters, but then... Eh, Maybe it's not so French. Yeah, I, I questioned like halfway through. I was like, I wonder why they really felt the need. I mean, I, I think it was because of something that was happening topically in the news mm-hmm. with a real life character. But I don't know. Interesting decision. Let's talk a bit about the writing of this movie because there's obviously an interesting story there. The movie credits Orson Welles as based on, based on an idea by and looking at Wikipedia. Apparently, there's two two different sides of the story here. And like Welles, his version in a nutshell is that 
he was developing this film on his own and was basing it on the Henri Landreau serial killer, real life serial killer mm -hmm. in France, and thought it would be cool to cast Chaplin in it and play against type. Chaplin was, was into it. And according to Wells, Chaplin bought the screenplay, which Wells had already written, and did not want to be directed by another actor, wanted to direct himself, this being Charlie Chaplin. Apparently, Wells thinks that um, his version would have been better. <laughs> of course. It's not surprising, but I guess he, he thought Chaplin was, quote, a genius as an actor, but merely competent as a director. But apparently, Wells was in deep need of money. So he signed away all rights to the script. And Chaplin's version is he doesn't remember ever being given a screenplay by Wells at all. Chaplin, you know, remembers Orson Wells talking about it and wanted to do it sort of like documentary style almost about this serial killer and Chaplin thinking later that a comedic take on that might be kind of interesting. And so he then wrote the script himself, but feeling bad about the fact that he had backed out a Wells movie and, and sort of taking that as his inspiration agreed to give Orson five grand for the idea and screen credit. And mm -hmm. the, interest, the most interesting thing here on this page, of course, doesn't follow up it at all, but it says that, you know, Chaplin stated if he had known what Wells would eventually try to make out of it, he would have insisted on no screen credit at all. I have no idea what they're talking about there. Wow. Did, Ch did yeah, Wells no, make wrong. a movie, a similar movie about a murderer that I don't know about? <laughs> Probably. Yeah, maybe. maybe. Jesus. Considering this one uh, uh, got by us. Yeah, so if somebody knows what the heck he's talking about, um, clue us in here, because that, that's, that's pretty crazy. I would love to know what that is and, and why Chaplin disliked it so much. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I think that's, that's this movie. That is uh, Monsieur Verdu. I believe you're right. Would you recommend this movie to people? Again, I would recommend it to anyone who loves movies. If you are interested in movie history, if you're interested in any of that kind of stuff, absolutely. I don't think I would recommend it to the casual viewer. But yeah, for people who are, you know, kind of steeped in this kind of stuff, this is one that feels like it fills in some blanks. I think so. I think, yeah, you know, if you're introducing someone to Chaplin, I wouldn't start with this at all. <laughs> you know, and maybe not even like three or four down. <laughs> but once they've got a little bit of background, yeah, throw them this one. I think that's 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 the reason to watch this. And I think that's the reason it probably got made, is wanting to see an actor play against type, you know, specifically coming from w where he came from in that silent comedy to um, to this. It's an interesting evolution, you know, and it's something that, you know, we've, we've certainly been privy to in, in our lifetime with a lot of comedic actors making that transition. You know, it doesn't always work. That is true. But it's cool when it does. And it's nice to know that, man, they've been trying to do that forever. So <laughs> We're all striving for. Hey, Sean. Yeah. Let's talk about what we're doing next time. Let's do talk about what we're doing next time. Okay. Now, I have several suggestions. Okay. Well, that's good because I've heard of all of them. Oh, well, aren't you sure of yourself? I'm a little sure. Lay them on me. Let's get started. Let's do it. Let's see what we got. All right. I'm going to start with an easy one. Which everyone's heard of. If you haven't heard of this, <laughs> you're an idiot. You're really putting the screws on me now. Okay. Yeah. First movie, White God. You're saying White God, not White Dog. Right. I've seen White Dog. White God. Wait a second. White God. I'm going to read you the synopsis, because remember, we go a little deeper into this now. All right, let's dig deeper. Year 2014. The synopsis on Netflix, where it's streaming right now, says... They've been kicked around long enough. They're ready to hit back. Lock your doors. These dogs have declared war. I have heard of this. Uh, it looks amazing. It does. Um, yeah, it, there's a bunch of dogs running around as a Pyrrhus. Yeah. The, the, the key image is a kid on his bike and like a million dogs chasing him. Craig, I, we both need to watch this, but I've yes. heard of it. I say let's, let's go on to the next one because this doesn't happen too often lately. But yeah, I've heard of that. Well, maybe this is a good time to plug our new podcast, Gotta Watch This. Okay. But we'll get to that. Yeah. Later on. All right, ready for this? I am. This one's easy, too. I and mean, this is so easy, you definitely, you definitely heard of this one. Okay. So don't even front. I'm going to front. The Homesman. Is that Tommy Lee Jones? That is Tommy Lee Jones, yes. Yeah, okay. I've heard of that. Then. All right. Yeah, maybe you'll hear of all these. Two Days, One Night. Another 2014-er. Not only have I heard of it, 
It's got your girl in it. You saw I've it. I've seen it. Oh, really? Yes. Is it good? It is good. Go watch that movie. It sounds so good to me. It's good. It's not as depressing as, as it, as it, as it, it looks sounds. like. All right. All right, Craig. I'll throw yeah. you a bone here. All right. I don't think you've heard of this. You heard of a movie from 2007, and it's not from this country of America. Oh. But it is called something very American. Mm-hmm. X Drummer. This is from the country of Belgium. You ever heard of a movie called X Drummer 2007? It stars some people that I know you don't know. <laughs> but I'll give you the synopsis if you want it. All right, yes. Three handicapped losers who form a band ask a famous writer to be their drummer. He joins the band and starts manipulating them. You know I like band movies. Lord knows. Uh Lord knows you do. Well, I got to tell you, Sean, I've never heard of X Drummer. And I'm sure it's going to be just as good as you say it is. (laughs) I don't know anything about it other than what I just read you. And it has an amazing poster. So that's what I'm going on. And yeah, I'm super psyched to check it out. I don't even know where you can find it online, but I bet you can find it somewhere. You look. You know what to oh, do. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> and if we can't find it, we'll let I'm you know. I'm not even sure if you can watch it. Yeah. We'll pick something else. But until then, go find L- X Drummer 2007, Belgium, and we'll talk about it then. Sounds good, Sean. All right, Chaplain. Until next time, don't kill anybody. One wife per person, please. Yeah, guys. Keep it to one wife per person. <laughs> All right. We'll talk next time. <laughs> <laughs>